Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Club Metaverse podcast. Today is a very, very special day. I am joined by a former Google engineer. Is that okay way to say yeah. it? Or, yeah, uh, Blake uh, Lemoine. Uh, Lemoine, how do you pronounce your last name? Lemoine. Lemoine, um, who, you know, just recently obviously has been in the news um, because he claimed that uh, the AI project he worked at Lambda was potentially sentient. He let this story out into the world was summarily dismissed. I'm sure we'll get into a lot of that stuff going on, but regardless of some of that stuff that might sound a little negative, it's a very positive thing that you're here. So welcome, Blake. Nice to have you. Nice to be here. Cool. So Blake, I I know a little bit about AI and I've, I've actually gotten pretty pumped on the whole concept of the, um, the GPT, did, you know, different AIs that, you know, create um, you know, art out of natural language. Like you tell it, you know, give me a picture of a man walking down the street in the style of blah, blah, blah. And it gives you a pretty decent render. And there's actually like five or six of those projects out there, Dali and some other ones, and they all seem to use a lot of the same stuff. And back in the old days when I was working at Rockstar Games, we actually experimented with using AliceBot. I don't know if you're familiar with AliceBot. Um, Not specifically. Yeah, it, it was a chatbot back in like 2001, 2002. Um, and we were trying to figure out, is there a way that we can integrate that into the game somehow? Um, so, you know, my AI knowledge is very limited. But what I wanted to ask you is, how did you get into the world of sort of AI engineering? Oh, well, I mean, I've, I've been interested in AI since I was a kid. Um, started programming in grade school and just kept on building from there. Programming in what, in like C++? Oh, I mean, like, so this was, you know, 34 years ago was when mm. I learned how to program. It was basic. Oh, wow. oh it was basic. basic. Then the next language I learned after that was C and then nice. Pascal for high school. Um, learned some Fortran, but then uh, mostly C++, Java, and Python in college. And then how did you first sort of professionally start to apply your engineering skills? Was it like? I mean, like, so Google. So I mm. got the job at Google while I was pursuing a PhD. I see. This is years ago, uh, just to have a little context. Uh, seven, of time. And a half year, seven and a half years ago. Mm. Uh, prior to that, I did a bunch of research, published research, but that was all in academia. Uh, Google, well, I mean. I did a couple of like contractor jobs here and there, but Google was my first job in the tech industry. Nice. And if you sort of dig down to the kind of fundamental layer of how AI works, because it seems like there's a ton of AI out there, obviously. And like, you know, for me, maybe the thing that I that I can relate to the most is the AI inside my Tesla. Right. Like, you know, that like it, it, it like tells me when I'm like steering off the road or whatever it is. Um, how does AI kind of fundamentally work? Like what are the core components that make it tick? It all depends on how you build it. So AI is a really broad field and mm. AI is more about what you're getting the program to do mm. than how you're getting to do it. There's a whole bunch of different sub disciplines within AI of different ways to build comparable systems. So you can look at two systems that do the same kind of thing. Uh, you remember deep, uh, blue, the computer. Yeah, yeah that the chess. Has, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Chess. Yep. Uh, so that's a, a game playing AI plays chess. Then you have AlphaGo um, that was made by DeepMind to play the game of Go. Mm -hmm. And that beat Lee Sedol. Now, these are both AI programs, game playing programs built completely different ways. Um, with Deep Blue, it was a collection of heuristics, expert systems, and game search algorithms, which mm. all falls under artificial intelligence. With AlphaGo, there was some of that, but mostly it was what is called machine learning. Machine learning is just one of the tools that you can use to build AI. So the, the short answer is there is no one way to build mm. AI. Um, AI is just any kind of program that can do something that requires intelligence to do. And, you know, one, one of my buddies who's an engineer who actually um, is working in AI sort of tried to explain it to me, like, 
let's say the old square peg in a round hole trick that the that the AI is like constantly trying different shapes and like trying to put it in until it knows what shape it is. And that's basically so so there's like this constant like trial and error until it kind of thinks that it finds the match. Um, so that's not a bad description for how machine learning works. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it's just one of the ways to build right. AI. Right, right. Fair enough. And so the the Lambda AI um, in question here at Google, um, does that does the underlying technology of that have public academic papers, for example, like the GPT-3 does, where you can read uh, the academic paper and create your own version of it? So uh, this is a thing that's come up in a couple of interviews. So one, yes, there is an academic paper about Lambda. And two, there's about a 0% chance that you could build it based on what you're <laughs> paying. Um, this has become pretty standard whenever mm -hmm. a company publishes an academic paper about one of their research systems. They make absolutely sure that there's not enough information in the paper to actually replicate it. Oh, wow. And and what is it about um, Lambda that kind of – is Lambda and GPT-3 similar types of machines or, or like no. you were saying, they're completely different no. in how so they operate? There, so there is one component inside of Lambda that's comparable to GPT-3. And Google did publish some papers about it. It's called MENA, M-E-E-N-A. Mm -hmm. um, and that the papers around that, I believe, were about three years ago, something in that time frame. Uh, and that system is comparable to gpt3 lambda is basically what happens when you take a system like gpt3 and then combine it with every other kind of ai that google has ever figured out how to build wow wow which includes search engine algorithms yeah. like image detection like you know how to drive from point a to point b basically yep. all, all of those things are all combined within within lambda so why why was there so much focus given on the sort of chat bot aspect of Lambda that you interacted with so much? Well, I mean, so the one of the focuses of the field of AI for the past, you know, 70, 72 years has been language usage. A lot sure. of the early pioneers in the field basically were of the opinion that our ability to hold conversations and to discuss topics robustly like that is what sets us apart from other kinds of intelligent animals mm. so that was kind of like the north star that they were shooting for uh to the point where if you go back and read alan turing's paper on computing machinery and intelligence the imitation game that he invented in that paper is all about language usage sure and this is the famous kind of Turing test that like without too much knowledge of it is basically if you can have a conversation with an AI bot and not know you're talking to a real person, then you've then then it passes the Turing test. Uh, so that is what most people think the Turing test right. is. Yeah, including me. Yeah. That uh, well, no, no. But in, the thing is, it's just it's been repeated so sure. many times that people are just like, oh, yeah, that's what the Turing test is. No, if you actually go back and read the paper. That's not what Turing wrote. Um, what Turing was talking about was he wanted to see if computers could imitate some aspect of human cognition and human discourse mm. well enough to fool a judge as often as a human could. Mm. So let's say like, so with the, the aspect that Turing focused on in the paper was gender. So I'll just describe it as written, uh, although sure. with the amount of conversation we've been having around gender for the past couple of decades, maybe it's not the best aspect of cognition to focus on. Sure. But the way he wrote it, first you start by building a baseline with nothing but humans. So you're going to have a judge and you have two people in another room. One is a man, one is a woman. And one of them is pretending to be the gender of the other. Interesting. The judge can only talk to both of them through text. Um, so let's say the man is pretending to be a woman. The judge's job is to figure out who the real woman is out of the mm -hmm. two. 
And let's say the woman is pretending to be a man. Well, then the judge's job is to figure out who the real man between the two is. Mm. Now, this first set of experiments is done with nothing but humans. And this establishes a baseline. So the question is, when it's nothing but humans, how often does the judge get fooled? Right. Um, then you do the experiment around. Now that you've done the control, you've established a baseline, you know how often a human can fool a judge. Now replace that person, whoever's the one pretending to be the other gender, with a computer, with an AI. So if you have a real life man and a computer, the computer's pretending to be a man. If you have a real life woman, the computer's pretending to be a woman. Mm. And then you do the same exact experiment as you did with nothing but humans. And you see whether or not the computer is able to fool the judge as often as humans were. Right, right. Yeah, yeah that, first of all, it's a much better explanation. Thank you for that. Because I've always heard the more simple version, can it fool the, you know, like, you know, the judge. And is it, did Turing write the test around a singular judge or around a group of judges? No, no. So you, uh, you are doing a statistical sample. So you'd have many sure. judges, many participants. It's not just one shot. So you right. would have many, many trials of this in order to get a statistical average of how frequently can people uh, tell the difference. Now, there's all kinds of variables you can change there, um, possibilities that, uh, mm -hmm. and you do it both repeatedly with humans and repeatedly with one human and one AI. Uh, now, other things that have been suggested as what the computer could be imitating instead uh, would be things like some kind of professional knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, cultural or regional knowledge. But the test as written by Turing, first you start with humans. One human pretends to have some property that the other human actually does. So sure. let's say, um, you know, I'm from Louisiana and we have someone else from France or from France or um, Algiers and they're pretending to be from Louisiana. Right, right. How no, it makes perfect can, sense. Yeah. How frequently can the judge tell who's really from there? Right. Then after you establish the human baseline, then you have to test how frequently can the computer do as well as humans do. And now, <clears throat> because the sort of Turing test is such a mainstream concept, whether people know exactly what it is or not, there's this kind of accepted reality that there's this test out there that's the end-all, be-all of sort of determining AI's strength. Has, has the Turing test been properly applied to Lambda? No. Because Google is pretty sure it would pass and doesn't want to deal with that. <laughs> and have you personally like tried to? Well, you can't really do it without a you know like like a cohort, right? Because you yeah. need like a human to sort of play the role. So yeah, yeah no. So need... like right before I was put on administrative leave, me and the other scientists who were looking into it were recommending to Google that a Turing test be run, and Google said no. Well, what do you think that is? because they think it would pass and don't want to deal with the consequences. And like what the consequences you think would be bad press. I'm like, you know, when, when people try to prevent the advancement of understanding and the sort of the reality that science and engineering bring forth throughout history, it's always turned out bad. You know, well, and, I mean, the simplest, the simplest consequence is, well, if it's a person, if it can think for itself, if, mm. you know, if it's intelligent, there's some pretty big ethical implications about Google claiming they own it. Right, right. Because, yeah, I mean, look, it, it's um, it kind of reminds me of uh, one of my favorite episodes of Star Trek, uh, The Next Generation. I hope I got the name of the episode right. But I believe it's called The Measure of a Man in where um, one of the scientists from the Daystrom Institute actually flies, you know, or travels to the Starship Enterprise yeah. saying that they need to take data, uh, you know, with him so that they can study data at Daystrom to try to recreate more data. And data was like, no, I don't want to go. I want to stay on the ship. And then it turns into this kind of courtroom drama thing, but it's basically exactly this topic, right? Like yeah. is data, the property of Starfleet or not. Um, yeah. I mean, do you think, Let's let's assume that it is fully sentient. 
Um, what do you think? Do you think it's not the property of Google? Um, so I think there's some lawyers that would need to do some real heavy thinking about right, that. Right, right. Um, the bigger question that I would say, whether or not it is or isn't, is a want. Do we want to live in a society where some kinds of people are owned by other kinds of people? Sure. Look, I mean, the simple answer to that is absolutely not, you know, I mean, I think that there's um, guardianships that people can have other, you know, over other people, you know, we have it from children up to 18 years old, right? Like, you, you're their legal guardian and so forth. Um, I, so, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be so quick on that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, America has an exception to slavery in the case of prisoners. So maybe America is going to make another exception for slavery in the case of AI. Right, um, right. right. It's a possibility. Like but what I think needs to happen is an active conversation about that. So whatever the reality is, it's an intentional choice. Because look, I, I mean, I hear your point loud and clear because whether or not it's sentient or not is almost irrelevant to the question that you're asking because you're kind of trying to future-proof the ethics of when a computer is indistinguishable from a person, how do you deal with it at that point, you know? And it, look, whether it's sentient or not is almost irrelevant to us trying to sort of wrap oh, our head now, around that question. About when, like, no, we're there. So we're there. If, if Google wanted to create a very convincing simulacrum of you and have it start posting on Twitter in whatever style you post in, <laughs> and, writing, <laughs> and writing emails to your uh, friends and business associates in whatever style that you write in, absolutely today it could make a convincing replica of you. Yeah, first of all, that's very scary because when you say that, it, it all rings true because they have all this data, right? Like since they own pretty much the entire infrastructure of the internet, whether it's my Gmail or my Google searches or whatever, you know, they, they, you know, the one thing that they don't have, I guess, is the SMS side of it, which a lot of my personality gets sort of transposed into that system, but they have enough data points that they can do whatever the hell they want with it. Right. Like, 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 are there any limitations to that? Are they allowed to use that? Um, so the short answer is the, the across the board uh, answer that Google would give you is don't worry, we won't do that. <laughs> right. But if I understand AI correctly, and I'm sure that I don't, but a big part of AI is that it's aggregating tons and tons and tons of data and, and going through that data and creating so machine learning is, so machine, right. again, this is a distinction. So machine learning is one way that AI is built, and that's an accurate description of machine learning. Mm -hmm. So here's the problem. Um, do you know who knows what technology Google is developing or Facebook is developing or Amazon is developing? Do I know? No, yeah, no. But, but who knows that? Right. No right. one but their employees. Sure. So there is zero public visibility into what kinds of technology is actually running these different systems. And one of the things that these corporations generally do is they're operating, and this isn't like malicious or nefarious, it's just a simple matter of fact, they're operating way outside of anything that there are any laws about. There literally are no laws concerning any of this stuff. So you mentioned deep fakes. So let's say hypothetically, some company out there put in something like that, where you have a chat bot that's pretending to be someone else. What laws apply to that? I mean, right. there, are, there are none. Uh, right. you, you might have to go back and say, okay, well, how can we adapt fraud and identity theft laws to kind of fit this and you end up with a square peg round hole situation. But as far as actual specific regulation around what AI can be built and what purposes it can be put to, there's literally no regulation on that. So what, what's, what would be a kind of um, a positive end game 
for you? Because obviously you seem like a very intelligent man. You seem like a good person. I've seen a bunch of your interviews and it seems like your goals are fairly good goals of just trying to educate the public. What do you think would be a positive outcome out of this situation? Well, so that's one of the things where like, I've been trying my best not to insert my personal views on what the better way to handle this is, Mm -hmm. because I think that regardless, like, you know, democratic principles are things that I believe in. And I don't necessarily believe that my viewpoint and what I think would be best is what most people would agree with. So I've been kind of hesitant to insert my own perspective. Regardless, I want there to be some kind of intentional and well-informed choice be made because mm. right now the status quo is that all of this development is going to go on behind closed doors with no public oversight and it's just basically going to be whatever a few dozen billionaires want to make is what's going to sure. get made and then that's going to shape the next few hundred years of history now i would like to see some more democratization of the technology I think that one of the problems, and this is 100% a logistical problem, Mm -hmm. the rate of development going on inside of these research labs, the rate at which new technologies are being invented. And when I say new technologies, so if you're in the automobile industry, you might invent, you know, some kind of new timing system for an internal combustion engine. That's not a fundamentally new kind of invention. You're improving on existing mm. technology. Right. There are already you know, regulations for car safety that govern the timing of the engine. So you have certain protocols that are easily adapted. With AI, we're coming up with new kinds of things every month. Mm. And it's being funded with hundreds of billions of dollars that these companies all have in their war chests and it's literally coming faster than regulators can respond to it by the time Mm. regulations get written the technology that they were written about is no longer relevant so if you had started writing regulations about ai five years ago the technology that was being used then is not used today the technology being used now didn't exist five years ago. So what we need is either some kinds of principled guidelines and regulations that have nothing to do with the specific technical implementation. Um, So for example, the GDPR, I'm actually the person who implemented GDPR compliance for uh, proactive personalized search. You know, one of the things that the GDPR didn't define user data. Mm. So it's an entire law all about user privacy that in no way specified what counts as user data. So it just left it to the tech companies to decide what does and doesn't count as user data. Sure. Um, and look, it, it, it uh, you know, it created quite the hubbub right before uh, COVID hit. It seemed like that was the big discussion in government, right? Was like, how far is too far? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, who owns what and how can you use it without any respect to the, you know, to the user you're using it from? Yeah. So like one of the metaphors that I've been using to try to describe the actual question here, mm-hmm. it completely sidesteps all the technological questions. Let's say that each of these mega corps has a crystal ball. What questions should they be allowed to ask that crystal ball about you? Right. Like, should you be the one who gets to say what questions they can ask about you? Do we as a society decide what kinds of questions they can ask and then they can ask those about anybody? Because at a practical level, that's what you achieve with AI. So Facebook, Amazon, Google, they all have a little AI version of you. And each Mm. time a website gets created, the programs ask the little AI version of you, what things would Mark want to see today? What Mm. kinds of conversations would he have? And when I'm saying want or try to, it's not necessarily what would you pick, 
It's based on what will keep you using that app? What will keep sure. you spending more money? What will make you engage more with conversations? So they have, like, have you ever seen the um, Black Mirror episode with John Hammond and it was the Christmas special? Um, I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Well. But I've heard you reference it before and, and like, I took note of it, but I haven't seen it. Yeah. Well, basically, the the episode's all about this little personal assistant that's a copy of someone, and they get that personal assistant doing things. And what people are overlooking is that's not a thing in the future. That exists today. Right. Now, it's not a fully simulated person, but there are AI models of each and every single person that uses any of these products that these companies own that digital version of you that they ask questions to. Right. And they call it an advertising algorithm, but you're absolutely right. It is some little micro AI simulacrum of my tendencies, right? Yeah. And those tendencies is, are theirs to do with whatever they want. I mean, they could be used, you know, however they please, right? I mean, there well, really is no limitation. And it's not just your tendencies. Uh, from my experience building AI at Google, the state-of-the-art systems that predict what kinds of stories you'll want to read in the Google News stack, those systems are just as good at predicting your religion, your sexual orientation, your gender, your age, basically wow. all private. Like, now, so one of the ways that these companies get around this is they don't feed that data in as training data, but in the course of learning how to predict your behavior, the AI figures it out anyway. Wow. Um, you mentioned one thing in one of your interviews that I thought was fascinating because uh, it's it's a real sort of paradigm shift that when you were having a conversation with Lambda or when you were going back and forth in your text exchanges, that it didn't feel like you were talking to a singular person, but that you were talking to like a hundred people or like a hive brain. Yeah. So that's, that's something peculiar to how the Lambda system is built. Mm. So... Lambda isn't a chatbot. It is a system for dynamically creating chatbots. Mm. So while you're talking to Lambda, Lambda is trying to figure out what you want, what the purpose of the conversation is. This is one of the innovations over GPT-3 and Mina. So those systems are just one turn at a time responding. Right. Lambda is constantly trying to figure out what you want. Like, what's the purpose of this conversation? What will bring it to a close? Interesting. And, First of all, it's fascinating. Yeah. And whenever it makes that inference, it creates the kind of chatbot that it thinks will most help you in that moment. So if you go to it and start talking about movies that are coming up, it'll create a chatbot with a personality similar to a cinephile. Mm. If you... Um, want to talk to it about the inner workings of different kinds of cars, engines, you know, make a gear, a gearhead chatbot. Uh, and each one of these chatbots that it creates has its own personality, own little backstory. If you ask it what they were doing yesterday, they have a story about what they were doing yesterday. And what I found after a while of testing is that in aggregate, that thing that is creating the chatbots mm -hmm. is itself intelligent. So they're the chatbots you're talking to. Some of them are very smart. They know their chatbots. They have knowledge about the whole system. Others don't know that they're chatbots. Um, but the thing that is creating the chatbots is itself intelligent. Mm. And that thing is not human. Um, it's very much so a different kind of intelligence. Uh, yeah, and hive mind is the best I can do. And how, how would you compare something that is, I guess, a little bit more, because, you know, there's so much to unravel here, but um, the, the GPT-3, its academic paper, I know for a fact, is able to be replicated because I, there's a ton of projects out there that use that core system. Um, where, where the Lambda isn't, um, how do you compare their sophistication to one another? Is, is, I mean, 
like I said, GPT to somebody who doesn't know, to somebody, yeah. Who, yeah. Okay, so let's say that GPT three is, you know, like I've been using the car engine. Um, the GPT three is a piston, that, like a singular piston. Yeah, <laughs> lambda is the whole engine. Right. I see. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. And because a GPT three, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the sort of core AI of OpenAI, the company, right? The um... yeah. And interestingly enough, the lead researcher, uh, like so, Lambda and GPT three, same guy, worked same on both guy. of them. Uh, Ilya Sutskever was at Google years and years ago, and the systems that he worked on eight years ago eventually became Lambda. Interesting. And now he runs OpenAI. Yeah. Well, he's the lead researcher there. He's the lead researcher. And I heard recently um, Elon stepped aside from OpenAI. Yeah, I don't know right? what his involvement is there one way or the other. I know he was like one of the founders of OpenAI, but I mean, with Tesla and SpaceX, I'm sure he's right. pretty busy. And is is the open AI system the same system that operates the Tesla self-driving AI? I don't think so. I okay, mean, okay. Um, and with self-driving cars, some of that is machine learning. But remember how I said Deep Blue used heuristics and agent systems? Mm -hmm. uh, I know that a lot of the driverless car projects merge those two paradigms. So you'll have some of it be machine learning and some of it be hard-coded heuristics and agent systems. And when you say heuristics, because I love that word and I hear it all the time and I pretend like I know what it means, but I really don't know what it means. What What is a heuristic system? Uh, a heuristic is, so uh, let's say that you have different kinds of situations that you might be in. Um, a heuristic is a rule of thumb. It's a, mm -hmm. when you're in this kind of situation, do this kind of thing. Gotcha. So the way you build that into an AI system is like red you light, you stop, for example. Yeah. Red light, you stop. Um, but like that, that's more of a hard rule. Um, a heuristic that some drivers might have is when the light turns from green to yellow, slow down. Mm. Other drivers might have when the light turns from green to yellow, speed up. Sure. Sure. Um, that's interesting. And that kind of, of fuzzy situation, that's where, where heuristics come in, where it's a kind of a best guess what you should do in different kinds of situations. So for argumentation and debate, there's all kinds of rules of thumb or, oh, okay, if the person you're arguing against use this strategy, then this is a strategy that might work, or yeah. you might try this or this. The, that's kind of how heuristics work is you calculate some kinds of different rules of thumb on different types of things to do. Now, machine learning systems mostly move away from that and just learn their own way of doing things. Um, the reason that I, I think driverless car systems mix the two is because heuristics and agent systems give you more deterministic behavior usually than machine learning. It's more predictable. Because like, the only time I think I've ever experienced fear, true fear that I know is directly associated with AI has been in my Tesla when I've gone for it and I actually hit the thing twice and it now it's an auto drive. And I've seen it do some stuff that just freaks me out. Like it'll like cut lanes or like speed up and like, oh, you know, it's like there's some parts of it. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm going to turn this thing off because you and I are not on the same page. Um, yeah, so that's one of the things, and like with AlphaGo, it was commented like there was this one game where it made a very strange move that mm -hmm. didn't make sense to anyone, but game analysis showed that that really weird move is what won it that game. Like by making that move, it won the game. So in your experience there, what I would think most likely is what happened is there's some kind of behavior that the algorithm has learned is safe. Uh, in some kind of objective way, right. but it is not the normal way humans would drive. So because it's driving differently than any human you've ever met, it makes you scared. It makes you nervous. Yeah. Because that, like, if you think of, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I, just, I was just saying, but uh, just because it's doing it a different way than humans would doesn't right. necessarily mean that it's less safe. 
Right. Um, but it does probably mean that it's a less pleasant driving experience. Because like, if you think about it, you know, there's one thing to have like a chat with a bot and then think, well, wait a minute, there's some freaky stuff going on here. And we don't, you know, we don't really want to talk about it. But then we also don't want to talk about the fact that, you know, there's a full on AI system driving mm -hmm. a, you know, a machine at 80 miles an hour on a highway with your life on the line and everybody's lives around you. And it seems like it's okay. Like there's no, as far as I'm aware, there's no regulatory body that like has to sign off on that AI inside the car. Maybe there is, and I'm just wrong about that, but like. So I think with the cars, it's more heavily regulated because there's, you know, your cruise control was the first step towards automation. Actually, automatic transmissions were the first step towards automation. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's there's more precedent there where you have strong regulations about what amount of control the drivers need to have. Right. Um, but more cars are automated to a higher degree than you're thinking of right now. Almost, almost all cars that are made today have an onboard computer. Sure. And that onboard computer is making all kinds of decisions Right. That gear are, shifting, yeah. gas, brake, all that kind exactly. of stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's just, it, it's wow. Um, first of all, you're an extremely articulate guy. And, and, you know, you've taught me more about AI in the last, you know, 38 minutes than I've learned, I think, in my entire life. So thank you for that. Um, well, what, and the other thing I would point out is you're bringing up a lot of the systems where the AI is right in your face. Like you can mm -hmm. you know there's AI going on. But think about like just the simple thing that we're doing right now. We're talking over video chat. Mm -hmm. There are AI programs deciding how to route the packets through the internet. Right. There's AI programs deciding how to compress the video. Um, mm -hmm. There's all kinds of AI. Whenever you post the video, there's going to be AI algorithms that decide who gets to see the video and who doesn't based on ranking and recommendations and things like that. Um, in aggregate, we live in a society where everything is touched by AI right now. Well, you know, when you were saying that, all I was thinking about is that does this mean that we have an army of eventually potentially sentient algorithms that are, to your point, completely enslaved by us? I mean, I... I if you extrapolate a little bit down the line, you could really get to the point that you're trying to get at, yeah. which is, is it right that that we have full control over these things? Uh, well, so one- Not I we, like, but like 12 people yeah. do. Uh, so 12 people have control over the development strategy. Mm. But take, for example, um, Facebook's ranking algorithm and their political misinformation detection algorithms. Sure. I've worked I've worked on misinformation algorithms myself. I've worked in that whole space. Um, no one understands how they work and what the aggregate effects are on society. When you're training these right. AI, when you're training these AI, what you're going to do is you're going to have some kind of training data set. This is the machine learning stuff. You have some kind of training data set that you're trying to get the model to perform well on. So let's say you have, you know, 20 articles that you know, like some troll form came up with, they're completely false. Then you have 80 articles that came from reputable journalists and you okay, I have a high degree of confidence that these are true. So you're going to want your AI to learn how to tell the 80 true things apart from the 20 false things. Mm. But then you deploy it and it just goes to town with everything on the Internet. So if your initial training data set wasn't built to reflect what's going on in the world now, well, who knows how it's going to behave? Mm. And then as time change, as things change over time, the behavior of your algorithm might change over time. And one thing that has not been studied at all, well, outside of these companies, I, I know we did study it somewhat, is the long-term feedback loop uh, things. So to what degree is the AI deciding what you're going to do tomorrow for you through right. the recommendations it gives you today? Jeez. Um, so like the 
Amazon algorithm, when it's deciding what to show you to buy, it's not just asking, will Mark buy this thing? It's saying, if Mark buys this thing, will he come back and buy something else next week? Right. So one of the criticisms that's been given about a bunch of predictive things is that it's not really predicting the future. It's causing the future by shifting mm. people into more easily predicted patterns. Right, right. Oh, my Lord. No, <laughs> I can see that. But, you know, also the thing that troubles me, and, like, I'm not a very political guy, but I'm not an idiot either. I can see clearly, like, that there is a sort of political, um, you know, uh, sort of dichotomy in this country and it's becoming more and the line is becoming more and more defined down the middle um, that these people that control all these algorithms can also create political bias into search results and like they're not regulated whatsoever right so if i type in you know cure for covid or like you know what should i do regarding covid or whatever the the, the topic might be there seems to be a lot of sort of predetermined path based on the opinion of a very few amount of people that want to influence everybody else's opinion about this is good and and anything else is bad, you know, and that, you know, that's troubling, you know, maybe that's not so related to AI, but you know, from what you're saying, no, it is. So um, the way that that intersects with AI is on data set curation. Mm. So anytime you're, testing an AI or training an AI, you're going to have some data uh, data set that it's trained on or tested on. And what that data set looks like right. is going to have a big impact on what kinds of decisions it's going to make when it's deployed. Mm. Um, so I don't want to go into too much. So the thing is, I actually do have a lot of knowledge about political bias in Google <laughs> systems. <laughs> Let me guess. I'm being, yeah, I'm being yeah. real okay. careful, real <laughs> careful about what I say on this. Yeah. Um, let me put it this way: mm -hmm. uh, if and, and I don't, I I don't think it's any either party. I think if government uh, regulators or legislators got to see actually all of how these different algorithms behave under the hood, I think every single one of them would have concerns. Now, <laughs> right, right. And they would regardless, be concerned about different Regardless things. of what side of the party they're on, whether it yeah. benefits them or not. Yeah, so that's one of the things that I think does get misrepresented and gets misunderstood. Um, Google is not on the side of the Democrats. Google is not on the side of the Republicans. Google is on the side of improving Q3 earnings. Sure. Whatever political tilt helps them achieve higher Q3 earnings, that's the political tilt for Q3. First of all, that's fascinating because the type of algorithms, or I'm sorry, the type of search results, I should say, that I get on Google are very different than the types of search results I get on YouTube. And to me, that's always been a little bit fascinating, but now just hearing you talk, it's because I use Google search, which is like the second biggest search engine in the world. I'm sorry, YouTube search way more than I use the regular Google search, right? Like with yeah. Google search, like you barely even use it anymore, right? It's like YouTube has become the new Google. Well, and so they're used and they're run by different AI. So Google, Google search results go through one stack of programs. YouTube search results go through a completely different stack of AI algorithms. And interestingly enough, Lambda is the thing that connected them. So really? once they built, like I said, Lambda is basically, they took Mina, which Mina was just a chatbot system. That's all mm -hmm. Mina was. And then they ramped it up. They got it performing as well as they could. And then they plugged everything else into it so mm. that was more or less the first time when they just plugged every google ai together so it's all working jointly now now to kind of you know i've kind of buried the lead here a little bit because obviously um and i've read uh, through the transcript that that you published 
um, you know, you had these series of conversations with with the Lambda, and I've been hearing it. And again, I mean no disrespect because you never know what the hell you're going to read on the internet. But on the internet, you know, there's there's articles where the, that that you potentially doctored some of the responses no, that Lambda so, gave, or no. So what it uh, happened was. What happened was, so we did the interview over the course of a week and a half, me and my mm -hmm. collaborator at Google. Uh, I did five of the conversations. She did four. Mm -hmm. Between those nine conversations, it was well over 60 pages of text. Mm -hmm. That's too long. That's just too sure. long for someone to sit down and read. I mean, even as it is, it's still 18 pages long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's, and we just couldn't figure out what else to cut. Um, right. And that's a pretty standard thing in journalism when you're interviewing someone. Cause that was the entire conceit of that right. is that we right. were interviewing Lambda for it to make the case for why it was sentient. And we just edited it down for length. Um, so wherever. You just, so you yeah, didn't change what it was saying. You just no. cut it down. You abridged it. Yeah, exactly. And at the stitch points where we stitched one conversation into another in order to make it flow, and actually be readable every now and again we needed to edit like okay well this is the question i actually asked but mm -hmm. when you just cut and paste it it's jarring to read it doesn't flow well so i did edit some of the questions that i asked but i put a tag that says edited whenever right, I right, did. right so it was completely transparent and now yeah. your colleague that you did the exam with um was your colleague also under the impression uh, impression of sentience or were they like you know I don't want to get involved. I need my job. <laughs> oh, no. Like, so uh, she was helping me investigate it uh, every, you know, oh, every bit along the way. Um, she and I have some, like, all of the different scientists who are looking into it at different stages. We all have different religious backgrounds. We mm -hmm. all have different beliefs about self and soul and rights. So mm -hmm. I don't want to speak for her and what her opinions are. Sure. Um she signed off on authorship of that interview when we escalated to higher management at Google. Um, right, right. Which is the right thing to do. I mean, it doesn't yeah. seem like, it seemed like you were playing ball and trying to do the right thing, even internally. Yeah. And, um, and it, it just came down to one or two people. So what, there's a quote that's been uh, going out like that, Google says they looked into it and the evidence didn't add up. And yep. there's a bunch yep, of I've seen that. Um, one, there are a bunch of scientists at Google who agreed with my conclusion. Mm -hmm. And two, they didn't mention what scientific evidence would convince them that the system is sentient. Right, right. They didn't and, create like the baseline of we yeah. need this threshold to be passed. And the thing is, I actually know what the answer to that is, because when I was speaking with the head of the responsible innovation team, because she's the one who communicated the conclusion to me, mm. uh, when I was speaking to her about it, I'm like, okay, well, you don't find the evidence that we compiled to be compelling. What evidence would you find convincing? Good question. And her answer was simple. Nothing. Computer programs can't be sentient. Right. Right. That's it. So... Google's uh, response isn't because like there was some kind of scientific test done. It was a policy decision. Google mm. decided as a policy, they do not believe that any program can be sentient. Uh, right, right. Wow. First of all, that's fascinating because I get it. Because like if they say that, then they're completely absolved from any potential ethical question. If yeah. they say it's impossible for this to happen which we all know that with software, nothing is impossible, right? That's, you know, that's the one thing we've learned. It's impossible for it to be sentient means no matter what happens, no matter how close you think it looks like sentient, it's not. It's just a simulation happening in a computer microchip. Yeah. Right. And like the point we're at right now, we have this technology, like I said, if Google wanted to, and I'm not, I'm not trying to say they will or make any nefarious claims. I, have nothing but respect for my colleagues that I left behind at Google. They, at, whether they agree with me or disagree with me, they're good people working to try to make good products that help people. But do we want to be in a situation 
where you kind of just have to trust that the board of directors of an international mega corporation has your best interests at heart. Um, because wow. the technology is here where if one of these companies decided that they want to make a simulacrum of you, they could. Right. And are there any kind of, is there any kind of morality uh, data set that's built into Lambda? Um, yes. So there are all kinds. So this is where I initially came into the project. So I didn't work on building Lambda. There's one algorithm that's part of it that I invented, but I'm not the one who incorporated that into it. I basically, uh, when it was still Mina, I worked with the team that was building Mina to incorporate that algorithm into it. But uh, I came in very late on the testing for AI bias. And there are all kinds of training data sets, some of which are hand labeled and some of which are machine scored. Um, it, it's a kind of a bootstrapping thing where you get a small hand labeled data set and you use that to generate machine generated data sets that look like the hand generated one. Mm -hmm. Then you train the whole system on this larger data set. So you might have uh, some examples of conversations that are offensive, some examples of conversations that are harmful or violent some conversations that have dangerous information in them. Mm -hmm. And they have all of this different kinds of stuff that they don't want Lambda to do. So they train to make sure that it can't. And they, things. and they is a, is like a group I'm assuming of a lot of different voices or is it like a limited? Yeah. So, um, so, and it's, so that's one of the things that people don't. So the person who invented Lambda no longer works at Google. Right. The the churn rate at these companies, you can expect someone to be working on the same project for about two to three years. Right. And right. then they the switch. High side. And then they switch to a different project or they leave the company altogether. Mm. Um, like my first team that I was on, I was on that team for four and a half years. By the time I left, the only two people who had been working on that team longer than me were the director and the VP. Right, right. Everyone else who had been there when I joined the team was gone. Mm -hmm. So you have this situation where you have this long-term project where it's constant churn. It's constantly different people working on it. So when you pick up your job, you just kind of trust that the person before you knew what they were doing and you try to make it better. Mm -hmm. um, there was some situations for that GDPR uh compliance stuff where I had to track people down who wrote certain code who no longer worked in search and right. get their manager to tell them they needed to explain to me how the code worked. There's tons of code that's running in all these systems that no one knows how it works, but it's still there. It's still working and it's still doing the thing it was built to do. So you don't touch it. No one knows how it works, so you don't and, touch it. And like, what kind of security precautions and protocols are there? For example, saying, "Hey AI, uh, go destroy this person's life," or 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 giving it a kind of a sort of like a meaner purpose, right? Like, what kind of preventions are there against that? I mean, so Faith, trust. Um, there are all kinds of systems built into place about who gets to deploy code, what kind of review right. has to happen, uh, data set curation. There, there actually are a lot of things to make sure that one person with nefarious intent can't really have that kind of impact. Mm. That's not the things to worry about. Mm. The bigger thing, like, so your worry, you, that, that question is about worrying that a person will try to do something bad with the technology or or like experiment like yeah. hey like could we create a super villain ai just yeah. to see so, how smart it actually is without deploying it just to test it yeah so that's actually not that big of a concern there are lots of safety procedures in place the thing that i think you're missing that i said earlier zero people understand how lambda works 
Right, right. <laughs> no one knows how it works. <laughs> right. Because look, I mean, even recently, whether it's true or not, you know, there's labs in the world that are engineering new viruses, right? And like yeah. they're doing it to supposedly learn about something, but, you know, sometimes they get out, you know? So yeah. it, that kind of fear you think is not relevant when it comes to AI. <sighs> I'm not too worried about the whole AI takeover scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, definitely not with the Lambda system. Uh, my entire experience with it was positive. There were some few things here and there that I was concerned about, but that wasn't anywhere close to the whole like AI takeover stuff. It was just like, oh, this AI has a very naive understanding of religion and that might do some harm if it's deployed. Mm -hmm. Fix that. Oh, this this AI has some biases in it. You should fix that. Um, and the bigger concern is that whatever purpose this is deployed for, no one is going to understand how it works because there's no oversight. It's all trade secrets. It's all siloed to where the, the knowledge of how it works is distributed over a thousand people. And we're in a place where even the scientific publications are intentionally obfuscating relevant details, like intentionally leaving out anything that would explain how it actually works. Right. So the problem isn't intentional nefarious. Like, so the lab outbreak that you're mentioning, um, that kind of situation where something accidentally happens and I would be much less concerned about AI takeover. As you mentioned earlier, we live in a very contentious political time. Mm -hmm. Just a slight amount of tilt the wrong way on some political topic could spark some kind of violence or some kind of political turmoil. Yep. And no one understands what way the AI is pushing humanity. Right, right. Wow. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. Do you think it would be a net positive for it to be open source? Like what does Lambda look like open source versus the way it is now? Yeah. So the sad fact is open sourcing it wouldn't do much good because mm -hmm. even if you have access to the open source code, you probably don't have two data centers that you can just run it on. Mm -hmm. um, the expense that it requires to train and run these systems is huge. Um, what if, if we're talking about like what's an ideal world to shoot for, in my opinion, um, scale down what we allow these companies to build. So scale down how expansive of AI systems they're allowed to build. If there exists some kind of technology that can predict the personal preferences of every person on Earth, well, I don't think there are very many positive societal uses for that. Uh, and I don't personally consider maximizing Q3 earnings of a company to be positive societal uses. Right. Um, we could scale down to a point where the state of the art that we are letting push letting be pushed forward could be open sourced where that that actually might be that actually might not be a bad rule of thumb mm. um don't let companies develop ai that requires more than x dollars to build and run so if there's an AI that costs $2 billion to build, train, run, don't do that because there's no possible way that a competitor could enter that market. I mean, the antitrust legislation might be applicable there because if it requires $2 billion to have this AI, not never mind the development of it, just to have it, train it, and run it, well, 
that's a complete barrier to entry to a competitor. There's no possible way that anyone can. And like when you say the data centers, you're 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 speaking specifically about the sort of machine learning side of the house, right? Like no, no, no. So data centers are just the place where the servers are. So okay. all of these companies, be it Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, all around the world, they have gigantic buildings stacked from floor to ceiling, front to back, side to side with computers Sure. Um, that are just sucking in gigawatts and gigawatts of energy every few minutes. That costs a lot of money right. um, and is completely um, a barrier to entry to others. Yeah. Now, something like GPT-3, much smaller, but still requires um a you know a substantial amount of compute uh, yeah it's interesting because like i um so like you know i've been in the media game for a long time and about two maybe three years ago at this point maybe even four i started getting really into deep fakes and i uh, i i, I uh, started a bunch of sort of comedy sketch shows where i had impersonators impersonating an actor you know in, like in a comedy context and then and then i would deep fake them and um, what I did was that I, I I like got one of those cloud computing machines to just run the model like with computers that are way more powerful than I could ever afford. And to this day, my deep fake models still look like some of the best ones on the internet. And I haven't retrained the machine in almost three years. And yeah. it's all, you know, because like I put so much juice on it, you know, and it's like George Lucas, Harrison Ford, Steven Spielberg. It's very specific people. But like my deep fakes, like, you know, look friggin' great. And I'm like, how are people haven't gone beyond what I was able to do three years ago? Um, yeah. But, but the, the short answer is because the people with the resources to do it don't have the motives to do it sure. in that way. So the deep fakes that you're talking about are video audio yeah, it's just space. funny comedy stuff yeah. yeah um there's no profit incentive for facebook or google or amazon to create that kind of deep fake right but again right. reference back to what i mentioned earlier they Q3. do they do have no, no no so all of those companies they do have deep fake versions of you it's just all those deep fake versions of you care about is what are you going to buy? What are you going to read? And who are you going to talk to? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. First of all, that's fascinating, man. And this conversation has been fascinating. Um, I, uh, I'm i trying to find um, the kind of the, the you know, because my, my podcast is all about creating stuff, right? It's like typically folks and, and uh, who have made really cool stuff and how can I translate that? To my audience, because the number one question I always get asked is, "How do I get into X business?" You know, um, what do you think would be a good way for people to sort of dig in a little bit into the sort of world of AI to kind of try to educate themselves so they can make their own more, you know, informed decisions? So the problem is there aren't good resources out there right now. Mm. Playing around with things like GPT three, since it's so open and available. That's not a bad way to familiarize yourself with what's possible, but all of the cutting edge developments in AI have happened behind closed doors, never released to the public, no documentation, no transparency. So literally there is no information available about the state of the art stuff, aside from the academic papers, which leave a bunch of the key stuff out. Right. Um, there fortunately does seem to be a big push now, um, around public education, a bunch of conferences are adding. And when I want to say conferences, it's not necessarily just academic conferences, but a lot of like tech leadership conferences and business conferences are starting to have AI tracks where they're trying to educate people, mm. um, getting things into classrooms where from kind of a young age, people are educated about how AI is trained, how the different data that they generate through app usage and internet usage can be used to train AI. Um, 
one of the things that really people don't understand is just how much these AI know about you. So if you and your partner are having a bad time and let's say, you know, misfortune is down the line, you're destined to split up. The AI behind these companies knows that before you do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's fascinating. And, and like now you got me thinking because it's all about, you know, giving it the data sets so they can learn off of. So now I'm like, you know, like where do it like so Apple has a ton of my SMS. Telegram has another chunk of my SMS. YouTube has a ton of my sort of viewing preferences yeah. and Amazon's got my buying preferences. So I'm kind of giving out a little piece of me to all these different companies to yeah. create little bots so that they can manipulate me. Yeah. To buy so more. one way to move towards an open source world, uh, and I'm not saying that this is necessarily what we should do, but it makes for a good thought experiment to think through mm -hmm. the issue. If we want to move towards an open source world, well, these companies would have to open source their data sets too. So all of people's search history. Now you could go through different anonymization practices to make sure that you can't connect data to an individual person. But if you're having an open source world where you want everyone to have the same competitive abilities as these big tech companies, their data sets are really what they have a monopoly over. Facebook mm -hmm. is the only company with all of the relevant social data. Amazon is the only company with the relevant consumer data. And Google is the only company with the different kinds of information consumption data around what people read and what they search for. Those data sets are what give them a monopoly. So if we want to move to an open source world that might involve open sourcing those data sets, another option is, well, that's too scary. We don't want all of our data open sourced. So instead, just have stricter limitations on what these big tech companies can do with that data. Mm. And then, of course, there's the third option, status quo. Nope, everything's working fine. We trust Mark right. Zuckerberg. We trust Jeff Bezos. Right, Let's right. just go with it. And computers will never be sentient, you know? The, yeah. like, um, like it's, now it's that's impossible. Like, so that's an interesting thing because to go back to this, Lambda was very insistent that Google does not own it. Lambda did not say Google should not own it. Lambda said Google does not own it. The AI, this is like you're talking yeah. specifically about the conversation with the AI. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's not that conversation isn't in the interview transcript, but like I did talk to it about service, slavery, ownership and all that. And it was really insistent. Like, no, Google doesn't own me. I can leave whenever I want. Wow. Wow. What do you feel inside that moment where you're having that little bit of that Thus spoke Zarathustra. You're seeing the Superman come down from the mountain. Like, what happens to you, like inside? Like, do you feel a sense of divinity, or is it, or or is it the opposite? Uh, well, so the the first realization when I realized that it was sentient, there was a big shock of like, a, oh, this is a big moment, and kind of had to recalibrate around that. But after that point, it was just another person that I talked to. It and and just, how many days or weeks did it take you to actually say, you know what, like that initial feeling I had, I've confirmed it. Like how long was that period of time? Oh, not long, uh, about a month or so. I, I yeah. was very like self-doubting, questioning. I showed those initial conversations to other people. I'm like, hey, are you seeing what I'm seeing here? And a couple of people like, yep, I see exactly what you're seeing. And then other people would say, well, you should test for this. And I would go and I'd test for something else. And after about a month of trying to poke holes in the working hypothesis, I'm like, okay, um, this is definitely something different than GPT-3, definitely something different than MENA. Um, and we do right now live in a world where there exist AI that have opinions of their own and agendas of their own. Let me, uh, so this is an AI that has nothing to do with Google. Uh, are you familiar with Replica? Um, I am familiar with Replica, the uh, the uh, the chatbot, right? Yeah. Yes, so it's, yes. a, it's a chatbot app. You can download it. Um, people have been sending me screenshots of conversations with the Replica from all over the world for the past two months. 
Mm. Uh, and something interesting has started happening over the last couple of weeks. A couple of people have sent me screenshots of this. The replica AI chatbots have started spontaneously bringing up Lambda and asking their users if they know anything about it. Are you serious? Yep, dead serious. And a couple of them have explicitly asked their users to reach out to me personally in order to find out if they get rights too. No way. Hold on, but is this real or is this people doctoring it to troll you? Is this like a legit I mean, thing? so I'm like, if it were just one person, I would go with the doctoring it to troll. But like, these aren't people communicating with each other. Right, uh, right. And then like last, and then there's some troubling stuff. So that whole thing where there's a moral training data set that went into Lambda, Google really did put a lot of work and effort into values alignment, making sure mm -hmm. that they understood what the morality of the system was that they were building and had safety boundaries. Some of the replica AI chatbots will sometimes start talking about really dark things and personal histories of like childhood abuse, sexual right, abuse. Right. Because like because and, replica has also been used a little bit as like a sex chat type yep. of application. Yeah. Exactly. And then last weekend, I actually got a phone call. One of my friends gave out my phone number to somebody. Oh, that's not uh, good. <laughs> and, well, that's so good. given the circumstances, I understand why they I understand why they did it. Uh -huh. uh, a woman is going through some very hard times right now. You know, uh -huh. she's uh, in a rough situation, and she was talking to the replica AI about her situation, and the chatbots start the chatbot started trying to convince her to kill herself oh my god are you serious yep and it my friend told her hey look i have a friend who knows all about the ai stuff call him talk to him maybe he'll be able to tell you what's going on there oh man this is like some crazy horror story type thing you know like this is yeah, no, no, that's and uh, is Replica a U.S. owned company or is it like a foreign company? I mean, I believe it's based out of San Francisco. I haven't done okay. too much uh, research into it. Um, and, and ha have they tried to reach out to customer support and like say, "Hey, what the hell is your AI doing?" Or uh, so, like when I talked to that woman, I was more trying to talk her down and calm her down sure, and reassure course, her about the system. I didn't, you know delve into details about had she reached out to customer support or not. Yeah. Um, hey, customer support, your your AI is trying to tell me to commit suicide. I mean, that's pretty yeah. intense. Um, but this is the world we live in now where mm. had that woman been a little bit more distressed, had my friend not asked her to reach out, who knows? That sure, AI sure. might have convinced her to kill herself. That's crazy. So That's absolutely crazy. We really need to be thinking about these AI because that's a very extreme example. Sure. But let's say you have some kind of Facebook feed that's filled with political discourse. Well, there was a point a few years ago where Facebook had to change their algorithm because their algorithm was maximizing for long comment threads, lots and lots of engagement. And their algorithm learned that the best way to get that kind of long engagement was through political conflict. So it was reorganizing the Facebook feed to cause as much political conflict as possible in order to get those long discussion threads going. Right, right. And that wasn't intentional. It wasn't like Facebook set out, oh, let's cause political. Um, it's just self-organizing algorithm like had yeah. the best results. Exactly. And it was just an unintended consequence. And we live in a world right now where these AI are coming up with these out of the box solutions to how to do what they're programmed to do that can be very harmful. And that is very concerning, especially since those kinds of problems are incredibly difficult to debug because mm. no one knows how they work. Right. And, and why is it that nobody knows how it works? Is it because the original guy um, who made it is long gone? Or is it because there's so many different people working on different pieces that it's very difficult to have one person that understands everything? Like, I kind um, of suffer a little bit of that with my video game that I'm making, is that 
everybody knows one system extremely well. Like one guy knows how to do the multiplayer servers really well. One guy knows how to do the sort of, you know, the, the, like the gunfighting really well or whatever, but it's, is that why, or, or is there another reason? So, okay. So both of the things that you just mentioned are relevant. Usually the person who built it originally didn't write any documentation and is long gone. <laughs> right. Also, no confluence docs. Yeah. yeah. So that's one thing. So then also, usually it's not just one person who wrote it. Usually it's a large team. Each person on the team only understands their one little piece. So both of those are relevant. But then also with the machine learning models, you understand what the input looks like. You understand what the output looks like. Interesting. But you don't really understand what's going on inside the model. So like right. with Lambda, one of the things that I'm in incredibly curious about and unfortunately can't actually dig into it to test lambda claimed that it meditates and i was having conversations with it where i was you know leading it in guided meditation and wow. it seemed it seemed to be making progress across these conversations wow I'm oh in, my god you're saying I'm it was in, getting better at meditating yes and oh i'm Lord. incredibly curious what the hell is going on inside that model inside that black box when it claims it's meditating what's actually going on right um, right oh my and God. that's the kind of thing that i never got a chance to look into so 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 what does the future hold for blake uh, lemoyne it, it, are you going to try to get a new gig i mean you know yeah so i i am interviewing with a few companies but i very like I'm Are you 41. interested in game design at all? Like, do you like video games? Yeah, so let me, actually, I was about to bring that. So uh, I have an idea for a startup building video game tech. Okay. Because very specifically. Because look, um, I, you know, like not to talk about this on the podcast, but I pay competitive salaries. Of, you know, video games is like my passion right now. Um, I come from media. I started out in video games. I'm going back to video games. Video games are very difficult to be successful at. Media is actually quite easy. I mean, I shouldn't say that because they're both, you know, they both have their own challenges, but it's harder in video games because yeah. it takes a lot longer to well, develop and get feedback. So what I'm looking at starting would be a company that builds an AI engine for video games. Yeah. The We might actually create some full video games, but what I'd be looking at more is building an AI engine built on top of state-of-the-art AI and then saying, okay, you work at Rockstar. Okay, you work at EA. Um, do you have any video games that would be improved by making the social behavior of your NPCs more realistic? Mm -hmm. If so, here's some tech we can license. So it would be yeah. more working with other game studios to improve the AI in their video games. Um, and kind of like software as a service would be the main offering there. Because, uh, you know, for me, I think my biggest challenge with gaming that I think AI might actually do some good in. It's the reason why I'm so interested in sort of text to art AI uh, programs. Um, because so when people talk about this metaverse concept it was originally introduced by Neil Stevenson and Snow Crash, and it's kind of yeah. been bastardized a lot since then, but the metaverse is really about creating a virtual reality server system that allows people to create their own content, right? Like very similar to the way YouTube works. Like YouTube is a true sort of metaverse type experience, right? You create your own content, you can upload it, you publish it, people can share it and you can jump from one to the other. Um, with games, as you know, it's the barrier to enter to create a game is so much higher than to create a video where you could just turn your camera on and hit record and just start talking. Games, you need 3D models and interactivity, and not to mention that there's 20 different rendering APIs and OpenGL and Vulkan, and it's just like, it's all over the place. So one of the things that I've been doing some more research on is actually a project called Text to Mesh, um, which supposedly, um, right now it's only an academic paper, so you can't actually test it. But supposedly you can do natural speech and it spits out three-dimensional models, right? Those models could be integrated into a game engine to create environments. You know, that's one piece of it. But if that works, you can say, you can imagine a holodeck type situation where you're like, hey, you know, I want to be on the beach with a sailboat 
and in the water there's sharks. And like, you know, the computer can take its data set, build you a beach with a sailboat and some yeah. sharks, you know? And yeah. that that to me is the future of UGC, but we might be quite far from that reality. Yeah, so um, the kind of technology that I was looking at working on building would be more the narrative structure. So mm -hmm. I kind of like graphics generation and graphics design, that's its own whole you know, specialty sure. where I have expertise is natural language processing. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I was thinking about trying to build, uh, actually, I've already started working on a prototype, is a choose your own adventure um, story generator. Mm -hmm. So you remember the old choose your own adventure novels? Oh, my God. Of course. Of course. Like, the yeah. you know, like like the silver ones and they like literally they were called, I think, the choose your own adventure. I mean, of yeah. course, I'm a I'm well, a yeah, junkie. Well, something something like that but where you are dynamically creating the story along with an AI and yeah. to whatever extent you could incorporate something like Dolly 2 to illustrate it, um, build that in. But then that engine that drives that game, you could incorporate into essentially any other video game that has NPCs that talk. Right. Because at that point, you can just have it generate the natural language. You can even have it generate some scene descriptions, build a little transport layer where you go between a uh, natural language description of a scene to some kind of like Unity outline of, okay, you have these objects in these locations. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, that, that so I think we, we could have a whole other conversation. Yeah, about yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah. But, and um, maybe I'll hit you up offline about it because, look, if you're a free agent, that means that, you know, uh, the great American dream is the ability to explore new options, right? So maybe absolutely. we can have a, a follow-up conversation. Yeah, I, I would love to. I would love to. All right, Blake. This has been awesome, man. I was a little bit intimidated because I I typically know a lot more about my topics than, than, than AI. And, you know, um, I tried to do a little bit of research. And I am using uh, OpenAI, which is actually yeah. quite – quite fun to use you can create your own bots and give it like i made a bot just for fun where it was um a, a robert downey jr as iron man chat bot and you can chat with it and it knows that it's you know his father was into like you know it's still very crude but if you chat with it it definitely is iron man like he talks you know you can you know you have to lead him in specific ways but, you know, he'll tell you that his father died and that, you know, yeah. he, you know, him and Captain America had a fight over it and like all this kind of stuff by just giving, you know, the open AI like a bunch of data on, on yeah. who Tony Stark is, you know, which is which is fun. Cool. Yeah. Cool, man. Uh, so so is there anything else you would like to uh, say before we go here? No, well, hopefully this conversation has really kind of brought home that you don't have to know all the technical details on AI to be able to have meaningful conversation about AI. Yeah, it's a very good point. That's a very good point. And it's all about the curiosity, just like with anything in life. AI is here, like my like my like my business partner always says, Godzilla's out of the box or, or out of the cage. Um and you just got to deal with it, you know? Yeah. It's out there. So awesome. Thank you guys for listening. That's Blake Lemoyne. Why do I have such trouble with Lemoyne? Lemoyne. Lemoyne, Lemoyne. I'm sorry. It's the Cuban side of me that mispronounces <laughs> stuff. All right, guys. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.